What a blast. It's great. Praise the Lord. Light this morning. Do you see the light? Do you see the light? It took everything, it took everything within him this morning for Dan not to be off the stage jumping around in the congregation with you all. He was, it was close. We almost went from here down to Louisiana, I think. Man. Good morning. Praise God. It's a great day. Happy Father's Day. It's great to be together. I love uh, being together with fathers. They got a little gleam in their eye uh, this morning that they're just, they're blessed. You know, we've got some uh, great fathers in this church that love the Lord, that are endeavoring to raise their children, uh, to glorify God, and, and uh, some of us are recipients of fathers like that. So let's, let's praise the Lord for the fathers this morning. You can take your Bibles this morning and go to uh, Luke chapter 5. The great thing about our God is uh, no matter what our fathers like, we're like good, bad, indifferent, absent, present. We've got a great, big, wonderful God who is our father, who is so desiring to be with his children every single day, every single moment. A lot to be thankful for in that. Uh, this morning, uh, my message is going to be uh, directed to those that are Christ followers. Are there any Christ followers in the room this morning? I got a couple. Amen. Praise God. Um, you remember when you first learned how to write? Do you remember when you first learned how to write? For some of Ron shaking his head. Uh, no, I don't. I don't remember. I don't. And I forgot since. Uh, you, we first learned about handwriting. And we learned about uh, the alphabet, right? And thankfully, someone invented a song so we could learn the alphabet even before we knew what that meant, all right? And uh, this morning, I was thinking about my daughter who's going to be in kindergarten in the fall. She's learning, she's learning how to write. She loves to write. And the way that you learn how to write is that you typically will use a sheet, something like this, right? Anybody remember these sheets here, right? Does that bring anything back to you, Ron? No, no, okay. <laughs> And, and it, was, it was slate and uh, chisels. So uh, the idea of this, okay, the idea of this is that at the beginning of the, um, of, of the page, you have the letter written correctly, nice and bold, so that the student can see what it's supposed to look like. And then the next one, you get a dotted line where you can trace over the letter to get the practice of spelling it correctly. And then oftentimes you'll have another one with the dotted line, and sometimes even the sheets have uh, a gradually diminishing dotted line, so that by the time you're done, you're ready to get things going on your own, and the space that's left after the, after the letters that are bolded and dotted line is for you to be able to do it yourself. And we, we, you know, we've gotten papers home from Eden at school where she's got different letters of the alphabet, where she traced in the first one dark, and then the next one she filled out the dotted line. And sure enough, by the time she got to the section that was open, she was able to mimic uh, the correct way to write it. Now, whether or not she knows that she's writing the letter A, B, or C, uh, that is almost secondary. The, the, the point is that she's following the pattern of what has been set before us. And this, this is a great uh, analogy for us to think about, about the Christian church. Jesus, uh, in his ministry, in his life, has given us the exact representation of what it looks like uh, to be a follower of, of to, to be a worshiper of God, uh, to be a, the kind of man that God wants us to be. And Jesus, with his disciples early on, he modeled the expectation of what church should be like. All right? You all see that fly too? Yeah. How long is that going to distract us from hearing things this morning? Get thee behind me, Satan. So Jesus and his disciples modeled what it should look like, and they passed down to uh, the disciples and the apostles post-Jesus' ascension a certain church culture of what the expectation would be about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And they had certain expectations and remembrances of what it was like being with the Lord. And then they pass something down to us. And this morning, we're going to look at some of these things. We're going to talk about following the original. Following the original. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus opens up his ministry and his fellowship with these words. Verse 14, after being tempted by Satan himself, 
which was much more intense than that fly just now. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of what? You see what that says? He left his time after being victorious over the temptations with Satan, and he came in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began doing what? Teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written the following. And listen to what Jesus read and said to the people in the congregation that morning. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free all those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. What was Jesus' ministry all about? Well, he was anointed with the Spirit. Why? Because he is supposed to be preaching the gospel to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And for the next few years, that's exactly what Jesus did. In the power of the Spirit, he delivered those that were in prison. He, he opened up the eyes of the blind, both literally and the eyes of their heart that were shut closed. And day after day, that is exactly what Jesus did. He gathered together him. He gathered together with him a band of followers, disciples, definitely a chief uh, number of twelve, and then others that followed as well. And he taught them that this is what they should be about too. And it all started with him being led from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, and the specific purpose of the Spirit being upon him to anoint him was to be able to fulfill this ministry that he was called to do. He closed the book in verse 20. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them something that would have been so strange for them to hear. They were in a culture at the time where they meditated upon the Scriptures. They heard the Scriptures. They were waiting for fulfillment of the Scriptures. They knew that much of the Scripture had been fulfilled, and they waited for the completion of the rest to be fulfilled. And after hearing this familiar passage about the servant of the Lord from Isaiah being read by this child of Nazareth, Jesus said the following, verse 21, Today, this Scripture has been what? Fulfilled. Imagine that. You hear what you just heard? That the servant of the Lord has been anointed to proclaim the gospel to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to release the captives. That just got fulfilled in your hearing this morning. Wow. 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 Look at verse 38. That's what Jesus was sent to do. Verse 38, time passes. He gets up and he leaves the synagogue, a different one at this time. And he entered into Simon's home. Simon is his disciple Peter. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from the high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And, Im and she immediately got up and waited on them. And while the sun was setting, all of those who, had, who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on them, each one of them, he was doing what? He was healing them. He just told us that he was anointed in the power of the Spirit to come and bring healing, to bring deliverance. And guess what? He was not just fronting. He wasn't just trying to think of a nice, clever catchphrase to get followers. Hey, it might sound cool to read this and be like, hey, that's fulfilled. Because the words don't mean anything unless it was backed up with the life lived in truth. Guess what? Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And guess what? He did set free the captives. He did heal those that were sick. He did deliver those that were oppressed. He opened the eyes of the blind. He did it. He wasn't just all talk. That's an understatement, if you've ever heard one. Verse 41, demons were coming out of many, saying, shouting, you are the Son of God, but rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ. And, and the day came that Jesus left and went to a secluded place. What do you think he's doing there in the secluded place? Probably, probably. He's probably praying. He's probably communing with his Father. He's probably gaining strength and refreshing that anointing of the Spirit. The crowds were searching for him, and they came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must 
preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Wouldn't it be nice to have this great miracle worker and preacher in your town? Absolutely. But Jesus' mission was not just to stay in Nazareth. It was to go and spread out into this whole region and to proclaim, not just in his healing, but in his teaching, that the kingdom of God was coming. He's preparing them to be ready for this great day of judgment and salvation. He's calling them to turn their lives around. And he's demonstrating the power of this message through the healings that he did. Please stay with us, Jesus. Please stay with us, Jesus. He says, no, I have to go to the other cities also. They need to hear this news too. You know why? Because I must go preach the gospel. That is the reason why I was sent. Jesus, what, what are you all about? What's your mission statement? What's your purpose in life? I was sent to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's what, he, that's what his answer was. Awesome. Awesome. When the disciples in Acts chapter 10, you don't have to turn there, when, when they're preaching, describing Jesus' ministry, this is what they said. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That was what Jesus was all about. That was the culture of Jesus and his disciples. The Holy Spirit was working, enabling them to speak this message and then to confirm that that message was true in power, in power. The church culture of Jesus and his early disciples was that of God-glorifying lives devoted to this cause. And then Jesus, at the end of his ministry, before he ascends to heaven, we're familiar with this from the last few weeks, he says something crazy. This is right before he ascends to the Father. He looks at his disciples. He's about to leave, and he says, Peace be with you. As the Father hath sent me, I also do what? Amen. What? They would have understood the great responsibility that that would have meant. This wasn't, hey, disciples, don't forget to take the garbage out on Thursday night before you go to sleep because garbage day is Friday, and I'm leaving on vacation, so now it's your job to do it. <laughs> that is laughable. That's not what he was saying. He says to them, peace be with you. As the Father hath sent me, guess what? I'm now sending you. I'm now sending you. In the same way that Jesus was sent by the Father to do what he was called to do, he's now sending his disciples to go and do the same thing. Now, they would have understood the great and high calling that that would have been. They understood the power in which Jesus worked. They understood the preaching of the gospel that Jesus would have spoke. And now he looks at them and tells them, all right, now it's your turn because I have work to do as well. Amazing. Now, look at Acts chapter 2. Let's see what happened. We're shifting on the page now from the first letter, which is bold and the right way. We're now shifting in this next section of what we're looking at this morning into the dotted line. You follow that, right? We're shifting from the exact representation of what it looked like, of what the church was supposed to be, and now through the book of Acts, which is the historical account of the disciples after Jesus left, we're on the dotted line now. And we're going we're gonna to assess whether or not they were able to trace the dotted line that Jesus left them and then be left with that same letter that we had in the first column. Okay? All right? Here's the thing. The, a powerful, amazing, beautiful thing of what we see in the book of Acts is before we get too far in the book of Acts, what we looked at last week on the day of Pentecost, is what did Jesus send and leave with his disciples? Comforter. The comforter the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of God and Christ themselves to be able to do this mission, right? We have to keep that in our mind now. That is what transpired post-Jesus' uh, ascension. Look what happens. Look at what the description of the early church is like in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. It says that they, talking about the church, the, the Christ followers of the time, it says that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the who? The through the apostles. Through the dotted line people, right? Not Jesus, 
But the people Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. And guess what? They followed the same pattern that Jesus left them with because guess what? Jesus empowered them through the Spirit. This is what their church culture was, was like. Verse 44, And all those who believed were together, and they had all things in common. They even began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity at heart. They were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know why things were like this in the, in the early church? It's because they had these verses already written down for them to read and said, oh, this is what the church is supposed to be like. We better hang out with each other and break bread in each other's houses. Oh, wait, we're supposed to share with each other? Oh, I better go share with you. Is that what happened? Did they already have this pre-recorded to know what it was supposed to look like? No. All they knew was that Jesus showed them how to live and that through the Spirit's power, this is just what happened. They didn't already know, well, listen, you got you to gotta make sure that in exactly at this right time that Lois sells something and gives it to Joan so that we can all watch and we can like, okay, good, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing here now. No, it was genuine. This is what the people of God just did. They were in awe of their great God. This is 50 days after their, their leader was hung on a cross for them. Right? This is, this is just... The, the flow of, of God's Spirit working in their heart that caused them to do this. Wait, you have a need? I got extra stuff. Here you go. It just made sense for them to do that because they were Christ's followers. What would Jesus do? Yeah, that's exactly what they would follow the pattern of. Beautiful. It didn't, the, the Jesus culture of the Gospels didn't end just because Jesus was at the right hand of God. In, in fact, it exploded throughout the, the whole region. There was a lot of it. There weren't just 12. 3,000 people just got baptized on the same day. Mmm, mmm is right. Can I get a mmm? Mmm. Chapter 4, please. What we're going to look at in, in Acts is we're going to look at some of the summary statements where Luke sort of sum, sums it all up, like this is what's going on in the church, and we're going to, the next chapter, well, this is what's happening. This is the church culture of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to them was his own, but all things were common property to them. You know why they did that? Because Jesus said, give to him who asks. They were just Christ followers. They just were doing what Jesus wanted them to do, and this is what happened. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring to the proceeds of the sales. There was no middle class. You have to understand there wasn't a middle class at this time. You had people that had property, and then you had people that had anything. And they took care of each other because they were a family. Verse 35, and they lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed as each person had any need. This is just wonderful. They're taking care of each other in the church and the apostles are giving testimony to the resurrection with great power, right? It wasn't just in their words, but there was a, there was a power behind their words that said, yeah, this is true. There was a recognition that God was behind what they were saying. It wasn't just a cleverly devised, you know, uh, speaking technique to gain people to join the club. God was working with them. Christ was working with his church. The Spirit was giving power and demonstration that what they were saying was true. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. I'll convince you of this by the end of this chapter. <laughs> by the end of this book. Verse 12, chapter 5. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to associate with them, however. However, the people held them in high esteem. Talking about their relationship with the outsiders. And all the more believers 
All the more, believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number. To such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. I mean, what a remarkable time. There, there's such a power behind the people in this church that there's such a, 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 an outpouring of what God's power, you know, and demonstrating what it's going to be like in the kingdom. That's the purpose of these miracles, right? Are there going to be lame people in the kingdom of God? No. So lame people were healed and said, see, this is true, right? That's, that's the heart behind it here. And, and there were so many people that were being drawn to the church that there wasn't enough room in the building, so they just hoped that Peter's shadow would pass them on the way with him walking to wherever he was going because they had such faith to people. They believed that the power of God was working in these people so much that if just his shadow would touch me, they would be healed. Are you serious? Are you serious? I mean, what, what an awesome time, right? This is just like it was when Jesus was around because Jesus is still with this church. He's giving, giving demonstration of that. You could turn to Acts chapter 8. As you're turning there, look at Acts uh, on the wall here. Acts 6 says, uh, the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Much of, uh, much of the uh, uh, church strategy of the modern-day American church does not reflect this idea of the number of disciples continue to increase greatly. A lot of churches are just, we can't lose anybody. We just want to, okay, we got, I, I got 75, I got to just keep 75, right? Do my best to keep 75. In the early church, it was increasing greatly. The number of disciples were increasing greatly because there was just a, a sense in, in the whole church, not just the leaders, that we got to do things the way Jesus did it. Jesus made disciples and so did the church. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, check this out. One of the leaders of the church was just stoned to death. Right? It wasn't all just great days. Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul in the next chapter, was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. So up to this point, we've had success, healing, let me just have Peter's shadow in the room with me and I'll be healed, okay? And now there's trouble. In fact, the, one, of the, one of the leaders of the church, Stephen, was just, was just anointed to be one of the leaders in the church, is stoned to death and killed. This was not a good day. This was a, tr this was a sad day. This was a tragic day. It says that some devout men, loud weeping and lamentation over him, right? However... The persecution increases from this. Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. So verse 4, Therefore those who had been scattered went about defeated, knowing that their time was over because St Stephen had been killed. Are you serious? Come on, look at this here. Verse 4, then those who had been scattered, why? Because there was a great persecution against them. They just stoned Stephen. So they went out to another place that was safe for them to do what? Get back to the mission. This is a people on mission, man, I'll tell you. They got pushed out by the persecution. But guess what? They got pushed out to a greater and wider audience. Chapter 11. Saul was one of the chief persecutors of the church. And between where we just were in Acts 8 uh, to Acts 11, Paul gets converted. Maybe, 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 maybe. 
Debbie, would you mind hitting the next slide over, please? Acts chapter, uh, chapter 11. Yeah, did it jam up or something? Yeah. It was that fly, probably. <laughs> Can you go to the other side? Yeah, there we go. No, other way. It's okay. Maybe I can do it now. All right, there we go. So in between the persecution, this happens. Uh, Paul is converted. And because of that, the main persecutor of the church joins the church so that the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, now what? They enjoy peace again. Being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it continued to do what? This whole circumstance of Stephen's martyrdom even gets Paul to become the great apostle. And it also sent the church out to a wider region in Samaria and Judea outside of just Jerusalem. In chapter 11, now that peace has come again, look what happens in verse 19. Then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, they made their way on now to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one else but Jews alone. But there were some of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who be believed turned to the Lord. And news about this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, the ones that were left. And they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with he encouraged them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They're just, they got persecuted. They have to move. And guess what? In these new cities where they're living, they just kept doing the mission. Because there wasn't an option. They didn't think, oh, what it means to be a Christian is to just sit around and sing hymns. This is what they understood as what it meant to be a Christian. They had been handed the letter A perfectly spelled out on the sheet. And they were handed then the dotted line that was their responsibility to fill in. They didn't know another option. They didn't know another way. That's what Jesus did. It must make sense if I'm a follower of Jesus that guess what? Wait for it. I'm going to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Acts 12. The word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. We're in Acts 12. Go one more. Acts 13. There it is. The disciples, Acts 13, they were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts 14 now, please. Acts 14, verse 27. This is what it was like when the church gathered in the book of Acts, okay? Verse 20, uh, let's start in 20. 26, they sailed to Antioch from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had accomplished. And when, when the disciples arrived and gathered the church together, they began to do what? They be, when the church gathered, what they did was they reported all the things that God had done with them. This is what church was like in the book of Acts. When they gathered together, they had a testimony of what God had been doing in their life throughout the rest of the week, don't you know? Wow. They gathered together, and they had a sermon to preach. Let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what God did. How he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they spent a long time with, disciple, with the disciples. Chapter 15, verse 3. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And what was it like in this church meeting? Again, they reported all that God had done with them. This is what it was like to gather in church in the first century. 
The individual members of the church had a testimony of what God was doing. This is just the church culture. There wasn't a mentality of, okay, I'm going to go to church. They were the church. And somewhere along the way, that's been lost. We people are the church. In America, yes, it's understood that this building is called a church building, and we go to church. And, I, and that, that makes sense. I understand that. But we can't get lost in the details that we don't go to church. We are the church. We don't just go to church. We are the church. Tell your neighbor that you don't just go to church. You are the church. I think your neighbor might need to hear that this morning. <laughs> Acts 16, verse 5 on the wall here. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Acts 19, verse 10. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord both Jews and Greeks. In two years, everyone in Asia, in this region of Asia Minor, Turkey, everyone, it doesn't say they all believe, but everybody heard the word of the Lord. You know why? Because the church didn't just go to church, they were the church. And they were continuing the pattern of following Jesus, who initially, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel and to redeem and to release the captives. And guess what? The church said, that's what Jesus did? Well, don't you know that's what I'm going to do? They didn't know any better Praise God, they didn't know any better. It continued. Verse 20 of chapter 19, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily. And guess what? Sometimes it prevailed. Sometimes the word of the Lord won out over the demons. Sometimes the word of the Lord won out over the sin. Sometimes the word of the Lord won out over the philosophy of the time. This is what it was like to be and go to church in the first century. They followed the pattern that they were handed by Jesus and the disciples, and they continued to be followers of Christ. Now, did they make mistakes? Absolutely they made mistakes. Did they make mistakes? Yes. Did they go through trials? Absolutely. Did they have successes? Yes. Did they have failures? Yes. Did people get healed? Yes. Did some people not? Yes. Did some people die? Yes. Did some people get stoned? Yes. Did the word prevail in some cities? Yes. Were they forbidden to go to other cities? Yes. It was real life. Right? I'm not, I'm not speaking these verses just so we get a false understanding that we're never going to have any problems. And anytime we ever speak the gospel to someone, they're instantly automatically going to believe. And you start walking around with a flashlight so your shadow falls on people. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> what I'm talking about is that was what it was like to be the church in the first century because that's what they were handed from Jesus of what it meant to be his followers, right? They had older members in their congregation. They had younger members in their congregation. They had married and single and, and children and, and orphans. They had it all. But that wasn't the focus. The focus was Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to go do the work of the Lord. And the apostles were anointed with the Holy Spirit to go and do the work of the Lord. And the church today has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Lord. That is why it has come. That is why it's here. This, this is the church culture. This is the church culture, if you understand what I mean by that. This is the church culture that has been handed down to me and you now. We're supposed to follow in the same pattern as the original. There's no place in Scripture where it says that's supposed to change now that we're in 2014 and have electricity and live in America and have cell phones. We incorporate all of that into the mission of what it means to be called the church. Right? The modern church has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to bring the good news to the poor and, and to open up the eyes of the blind and to release the captives. But there's a disconnect, at least in this country, in some places where the Church of Christ gathers. And that's exactly the problem. The disconnect is exactly the right word. Disconnected to the, the source in which the church is called to be the church, and that is the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. Like Pam mentioned last week, we're capable people. Even the, even the weakest among us is capable. 
We know how to drive cars. We know how to send emails. We know how to make banners and, and, and teach children things and go on the Internet and buy something in the United Kingdom and have it here in a day. I mean, we know how to do things. And Dan Matat knows how to play the guitar. And, and, and you know, we know how to sing. And PowerPoint's easy. And we're figuring out that we, you know, we know how to do all of those things. We know how to do all of those things. And let me say this. It's good that we know how to do all of those things. But we can't be disconnected from the source in which those things come to life so that God is glorified. And we can't be disconnected from the source so that if all those things went away, we'd be okay because we're still on mission following the Lord's command, right? Too often we follow a model other than the original. Well, what was church like for you growing up? That's either what we want or don't want church to be like today, Right? Our church culture may not be the same thing as what we've been handed in the Bible. Can I get an amen on that? It might not be, right? Our church culture might not allow for God to be glorified in the way that he might want us to be, right? Our expectation of what God can do in this generation, in this church, is we come to church, right, waiting to be fed. It's either a good sermon or not. We either sing the songs that we like or not. It's either too hot or not, it's either cold or not, the food's either good or not, the people we like that gather in this specific con congregation are either here or not, and we're happy about that, right? We sing the songs that we like, the PowerPoint messes up so we get all irritated and all, all the rest, right? We get in a fight with somebody while we're here because they say they didn't like something about this and that bothers us and they question how we made the lasagna or, or if the coffee didn't have enough cream. We get all pissed off and we're irritated. We go home and we're either happy or not whether or not we're entertained by the church. And it's a good day or not, whether or not all of those, uh, all, all the cylinders fired on the, right, on the right time. I want spectacular, loud, awesome worship. I want PowerPoint demonstrations that blow us away and cause us to glorify God every, even more. I want the lights to work. I want it to be air conditioned. I really want it to be air conditioned, okay? I want all of those things. But even more than that, please, I want the Lord. I want God. I don't want anything less. I don't want to settle for anything less. I don't want to settle just that, it, that it's pretty close to that. I want the real thing. I want God. In the depths of my soul, I don't want anything else. And for too long, I've settled for the counterfeit of pretty close to God. And, oh, it, it made me feel a certain way, so it must have been God. I want the Lord, and if the Lord is not in this place, I don't want it. I want Him. I want Him. That's all that matters to me. That's all that matters to me. And that hasn't always been what matters to me. But it is now. It is today. That's what I want. If the Lord is not in this place, then I don't want to be in this place. It says they were in awe of God. Every page, they were being stoned, but guess what? It says that they rejoiced on the way home. Peter was in prison. John was in prison, and guess what? The people were at home fervently praying for them. It wasn't just a blip on their radar. It was their life was all wrapped up in this. It was their life was their life. I want to follow this model. I want to follow Jesus Christ. I, I don't want to follow another model. I don't want to just be content with coming to church and hearing, or even worse, preaching a sermon. We need that, please. Some of you right now, I know your minds are like, yeah, finally, I don't have to come to church. I can just stay home. I've been preaching this for years. No, you need to come to church too, all right? This is where it happens. This is where the stories of what God has done are spoken. This is where spiritually inspired people will say, we got to correct the course here. We got to pray. Here are the needs. This is where we come together. We need that. I'm not preaching against, we stop coming here or anything like that. What I'm saying is that we, I want in the depths of my soul, the desire for God to be the foundation of all of this and for Christ to be leading his church. For Christ to be leading his church and for the spirit to be at work in all of our lives in a true and powerful demonstration that the Lord is with his people. And, and you know what? I, I, I felt like this was important for me. Let's go to Acts chapter 4.
I'm sorry that I have not been a better example for you to follow of Christ. I, that's what I desire to be, and you for me. That 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 it is it is uh, it is clear that God is at work amongst the people, right? And that the sentiment isn't, oh, that was a really nice teaching, Victor, and you were really funny and and handsome, or the oh, you sang the best songs and stuff like that, right? Or ugly, whatever. But but um, but that but that it is it is God in Christ working in me and in, in Charlie and in Pam and anyone that's up here teaching, and anyone that's leading your fellowship, and anyone that you're interacting with in this church. That's what I desire. That's what I desire above else. And I want to be, I want to be a vessel for God's God's spirit to dwell without limitations and for the genuine to be there. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Verse, uh, I, want, I want to close with this prayer because I think this is, I think this is the answer to why the church of the book of Acts was like this. Is because this, this demonstrates their heart. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are in prison. This is early on in, in the church, and, and this is just, I think it really is indicative of how their hearts must have been. Verse 24. Peter and John are released in verse 23. They go to their companions and they report to all the chief priests and the elders that they had said to, what they had said to them. In verse 24, and when they heard this, the church, they lifted their voice to God with one accord and they said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servants, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. I love that. You're like, why are they quoting Psalm 2? Like, that just doesn't make any sense. I thought they were praying. Why are they saying this? They're saying this because they are recognizing that God is in control. Okay? They, they, they reference a verse from the Old Testament that prophesied that the, the Messiah was going to be arrested and surrounded by these other kings. And they recognize that that's just happened, fresh in their mind. And they say, in verse 28, they recognize that ultimately that whole purpose was whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to, to occur, right? That might not have been the way you would have said it, but it's the way they said it. And what their heart is saying is that, God, you are exalted. You're above all. You're in charge of this whole thing here. That's the context of what they're about to pray, okay? In light of that, verse 29, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You see what they just prayed? See what they just prayed? Lord, take note of their threats. We're up against something here. And grant that your bondservants, in spite of whatever obstacles are before them, may speak your word with all confidence. That was, their de the desire, that was the desire of their heart after their leaders were just arrested. Can you, can you please, Lord, sovereign of the universe, grant us that we could speak your word with confidence? And while we do that, we pray, God, that you would extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders may take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What a prayer. God, we want to be out there for you. We want to be your servants. And we pray that you would confirm the things we're speaking so that we wouldn't be looked at as foolish, but that the words that we speak, we could speak in confidence, that we could reveal the hearts, the secret things of men's hearts, that you'd give us a word in our conversation with someone at our jobs that, that just happens to, 
stir up the very thing they were thinking of the night before. You use a word or a phrase that, that pierces them that, as if they, you, they think you knew what it was like when they were a kid. How did you know that? Where people are delivered, where they're, they're healed, where they're set free, just like Jesus started this all out in Luke chapter 4. Lord, can you give us the confidence and the boldness to be your people? That's all they wanted. They didn't pray, Lord, we don't want to go back to jail. It was horrible in there. They don't pray, Lord, please show us where we should hide Peter and John because they're our untouchable sacred leaders, and if we lose them, we're in trouble. No. Peter and John were dispensable. Whoop! We'll find somebody else filled with the Spirit to lead. It was about, it was about their hearts for God. Lord, we want to be bold for you. That was, that was all they wanted. God answered that prayer throughout the book of Acts, man. That's why we have the book of Acts, because somebody said, Lord, help us. And he said, okay. Lord, I'm not satisfied with the way things are. He said, okay. I want more of you, Lord. And he said, okay. God, there are problems in my life. And he said, okay. I want to be like Jesus. He said, okay. God, Christ, that spirit, they haven't changed. They're waiting for people to pray this prayer so he can say, okay, all right, he'll do his job. He'll do his job. The Lord our God is ever faithful, never changing through the ages. From this darkness, he will lead us, and forever I will sing that he's the Lord our God, that he's real, that he's working, that he's the living God, that he's not just stuck on these pages. He's jumping off of these pages in my life and in yours, and when we gather, there's a palpable sense that he is here and that he is working, that he is working. Verse 31, and when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with what? The very thing they prayed for. The very thing that they prayed for, God delivered and brought it immediately. You want to be a man for God? You want to be a woman for God? You want to stand for the Lord in this generation? You want to break through just going to church and be the church? Pray, Lord, give me the boldness to do that in spite of the obstacles, and then he will. He will. He will. He does. He has always been faithful to me when I prayed that prayer. My problem is I just stop praying that prayer, and I get caught up in stupid things. Hmm. When they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to sp speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were with one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were in common property to them. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Let's pray. God, this is our prayer this morning. This is what I desire from you and for you. I pray that you would open up my heart to be, to be bold for you, that we could speak for you, that we could live for you with boldness. Take note, Father, of the threats from the outside and from within my own flesh. And grant that you would enable me to be your servant to speak and to live for you with boldness. And I pray that you would grant through your power and demonstrate with signs, Father, and with words and with power and whatever it is you choose, you know what we need, God. You know what we need. But we ask, Lord, recognizing your sovereignty, recognizing your power, that you can, that you can. Oh, God, Hear our prayers this morning. Lord, this may seem daunting to us. It is. Father, we need you. We long for you. We desire your presence more and more. We've tasted it, but we want more of you. We want more of you, Lord. I pray that you would get our, our hearts inclined with your ways. Please, Father. I don't even know what else to pray right now, but I'm asking you that you would hear our hearts.
Fill your place. Fill your people with your Holy Spirit. That the darkness would flee. That the demons would flee. That your spirit would rest upon this place, God. In truth, the real deal, not just the fake, Father, but the real. We want you. We want the real God. We want the real Christ, the real spirit of power and truth. Father, we pray that you would be glorified. Lord, that it would not be that there's a, a place and a church and a people that is, is doing or speaking crazy things, but that you are the focus, that the gospel is the focus, that Christ is the focus. Please, God, fill us. Fill this place. Shake this place. Cleanse this place. Purify your house, your temple. We thank you for your grace, God. We thank you for your great grace that you have been with us and that you've bore with us and that you've forgiven us and that you've had mercy on us. And I thank you, God. And I pray that you would just do your work, Lord. This All I'm saying now is that you would help me and help us to be your servants, to be bold for you and to not accept anything less. Don't let this moment pass me by, God. You're so great. You're so great, God. There's none like you. Hallelujah to Yahweh. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. We thank you, God. We thank you for being ready and willing to do this through the power of your son's name. Demonstrate that he is alive and unstoppable. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing the Lord our God.